Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington here at Mount Vernon. I am Doug Bradburn. I'm the founding director, uh, which is an exciting title to have. It's the there can be only one founding director. I always say so. It's uh, it's good to see so many new faces here, as well as some old friends, as well. Uh, this is National Poetry Month. Uh, and uh, poetry is something that George Washington loved. And I had the great pleasure and, uh, and really honor to spend an afternoon with Ron Smith, who's the Poet Laureate of Virginia, and his lovely wife, Dolores. Maybe, I don't know, in the fall, Ron? And, and I'm always getting confronted by people with lots of great ideas. And uh, Ron had a great idea, which was let's, let's bring together a bunch of the great poets of Virginia in National Poetry Month and have, uh, have a poetry reading, read some history poems as well as uh, read some new poems, read some old poems, and then uh, spend a good afternoon. Uh, and I thought it was a brilliant idea and it's really exciting for me uh, that this all came together and it's exciting to see so many people in the room. Now Ron, the deal he made with me was not only did I have to supply him with tea and, and champagne, uh, but that I had to read a poem as well, which I'll do in a moment to kick off <coughs> to kick off the show, but then we'll, we'll hand it off to the professionals. Now, George Washington, as I said, he loved poetry. Uh, he subscribed to numerous works of poetry in his time. He patronized a number of poets. He sent poems to all sorts of people, including women other than Martha Washington. Uh, he uh, owned books of poetry, of course, and in his childhood exercise books, you all remember uh, George Washington's uh, rules of civility. Well, in those same exercise books, he copied down uh, a couple of poems. One was a poem on happiness, uh, and another was a Christmas poem as well. So poetry was a part of his life uh, from an early age and throughout his life, and, and it was very important to him. And I think one of the missions of the library here is a place where we hold George Washington's books and we're still collecting material, is to try to get at the man behind the mythos uh, behind the statues of George Washington. And there's one brilliant letter, I think, that he writes that, that gives you a side of Washington you never uh, really know and you don't hear of. And it's a, it's, a, it's a fun letter because he's introducing the poet Joel Barlow to his good friend, the Marquis de Lafayette. So Joel Barlow, as many of you will, have, will know, and some of you don't know, of course, wrote uh, a, po a poem called The Vision of Columbus, which is one of these masterful epic poems. Barlow was one of the Connecticut wits, and he was going to put the American Revolution on this grand historical scale uh, in the vision of Columbus. So it personifies Columbus having this vision of the future, and in that vision you know, are things like George Washington and, and the American Revolution. And Washington loved this poem, and he gave it to lots of different people, and he introduced Joel Barlow to the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, in, in interesting terms. He writes, Mr. Barlow is considered by those who are good judges to be a genius of the first magnitude and to be one of those bards who holds the key of the gates by which patriot sages and heroes are admitted to immortality. Such are your ancient bards who are both the priest and doorkeepers to the temple of fame. And these, my dear Marquis, are no vulgar functions. Men of real talents and arms have commonly approved themselves patriots of the liberal arts and friends to the poets of their own as well as former times. In some instances, by acting reciprocally, heroes have made poets and poets heroes. It's an extraordinary letter from George Washington, who's someone you don't think of in that vein. Uh, it's so extraordinary in that way, he actually recognizes the fact later on in the letter when he writes, I hardly know how it is that I'm drawn thus far on observations on a subject so foreign from those in which we are mostly talking about farming and politics. Uh, and so he, he recognizes himself in the course of this letter that he's, he sort of got off his normal, his normal path. But uh, Washington, the hero, was certainly made by poets in his own time, uh, and he patronized poets uh, in that way. And if you, you look at the, the, you know, the keys to fame are held by the bards and the poets. You look now that Alexander Hamilton gets to remain on the $10 bill because of bards and poets. 
uh, Washington was right uh, fundamentally about that. Uh, so that, that's a, a, a great context to remember. Now I'm going to read a poem. It's going to take about three and a half minutes, and this is going to get our juices flowing. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about why uh, I, I like this poem. Ron said you have to read it and talk about why you like it. That's just what I'll do. <laughs> Um, and the thing I love about this poem is that it was written at Mount Vernon. It was written in Mount Vernon in 1786 by David Humphreys, Colonel David Humphreys, who was another one of the Connecticut wits, and it's called uh, Mount Vernon and Ode. Uh, and let me go ahead and begin. By broad Potomac's azure tide, where Vernon's mount in sylvan pride displays its beauties far, great Washington to peaceful shades, where no unhallowed wish invades, retired from fields of war. Angels might see with joy the sage, who taught the battle where to rage or quenched its spreading flame on works of peace, employ that hand, which waved the blade of high command and hewed the path to fame. Let others sing his deeds in arms, a nation saved and conquest's charms, posterity shall hear, Twas mine, returned from Europe's courts, to share his thoughts, partake his sports, and soothe his partial ear. To thee, my friend, these lays belong. Thy happy seat inspires my song with gay perennial blooms, with fruitage fair and cool retreats, whose bowery wilderness of sweets the ancient air perfumes. Here spring its earliest buds displays. Here latest on the leafless sprays the plumy people sing, the vernal shower, the ripening year. The autumnal store, the winter drear, for three new pleasures bring. Here lapped in philosophic ease, within thy walks, beneath thy trees, amidst thine ample farms, no vulgar converse heroes hold, but past or future scenes unfold, or dwell on nature's charms. What wondrous era have we seen, placed on this isthmus, half between a rude and polished state? We saw the war tempestuous rise in arms a world, in blood the skies, in doubt an empire's fate. The storm is calmed, serened the heaven, and mildly over the climes of even expands the imperial day. O oh God, the source of light supreme, shed on our dusky morn a gleam to guide our doubtful way. Restrain dread power, our land from crimes. What seeks through blessed beyond all times so querulous an age? What means to freedom such disgust of change, of anarchy, the lust, the fickleness and rage? So spake his country's friend with sighs to find that country still despised the legacy he gave. And half he feared his toils were in vain and much that man would court a chain and live through vice a slave. A transient gloom o'ercast his mind. Yet still on providence reclined the patriot fond believed that power benign too much had done to leave an empire's task begun and perfectly achieved. Thus buoyed with hope, with virtue blessed, of every human bliss possessed, he meets the happier hours. His skies assume a lovelier blue, his prospects brighter rise to view, and fairer blooms his flowers. You can cheer, Let's, thank you. Uh -oh. Now, David Humphrey's ode, not loved today, floored in some ways, not exactly to the modern taste, widely published throughout America in 1786 in almost every newspaper that I've seen that exists. Uh, it was performed by school children in Massachusetts uh, and it became a very popular poem of the time. But there's three things about the poem that I like. Uh, one is when you start reading it, you think it's just going to be some sugary ode to Mount Vernon's beautiful bowers and trees and those sorts of things. Uh, and it's not that. Uh, it changes tenor in the middle. It shifts in its way. And it shifts in a way that is really authentic because that's the second thing I like about it. David Humphreys is here at Mount Vernon and he, he personifies himself in the poem. Uh, he has just arrived back from Europe, you know, and so when he says... Uh, uh, when he says, "'Twas mine returned from Europe's courts to share his thoughts, partake his sports, and soothe his partial ear." 
If you read Washington's diaries, Humphreys is with Washington all the time. They're going hunting together. They're partaking in sports together. They're traveling all over the place. And it's clear that Humphreys, who had been an aide-de-camp to George Washington, is, to a certain extent, Washington's confidant. He has his ear. They are uh, talking in that way. And so there's an authenticness to Humphreys' presence at Mount Vernon and his relationship with Washington in that moment that I like. And the third part that I like is, is precisely that, that he personifies George Washington in the poem. And reading it, it's not as easy to see because there's quotation marks where Washington starts speaking. Uh, and he, he, he has Washington really lamenting the state of the country. Anarchy is coming. The government is collapsing. What is going to happen? After all these things that we've struggled for, are they all just going to come to naught? Uh, and you know, and he's he's he has that his brow is is frustrated, right? He says that the country has forgot his legacy. To find the country still despised the legacy he gave, and legacy is in all caps when it's printed in in the uh, papers, because the legacy he's referring to is not some vague legacy of George Washington's. It's actually a circular that George Washington gave when he gave up power known as the circular to the states that became known as the legacy. Like we now think of the farewell address. This was the original farewell address. And it was called the legacy. And in it was a message about how it wasn't clear whether the American Revolution would be a blessing or a curse. It wasn't clear whether it would end well. And he had a bunch of things that he kind of asked the country to do uh, to shore up the weak government so that it wouldn't all collapse. And when he's saying, they're not listening to my legacy. He's specifically re referencing this thing. So Humphrey's poem is working in a political way in this moment of uh, what we call the, you know, the critical period of American history. A year after he writes this poem, of course, George Washington will be in Philadelphia about to sign the new constitution. So this is about the movement to bring a new constitution uh, together. But the other thing I like about, the final thing I, I think I like about the poem uh, in that political vein is the way he pictures Washington as being really negative and, and worried, but optimistic in the end. That Washington comes out of it saying that Providence has done too much for let, to let this all fall apart. And this is exactly what you see in Washington's letters at the time. Washington is saying all the time, everything's going to hell, oh, but it's going to be okay because Providence is on our side. So he, Washington has that practical, hard nature, but he's optimistic. And I think that's, he's, he's optimistic about the future of America. He's optimistic about this experiment. Uh, and that's captured as well in Humphrey's poem, I think. And that's what I, I really like about it. You know, and, and, and I would also say there's some nuggets. There's some, more, some tasty morsels, Ron, in this poem. It isn't all just sort of, you know, with gay perennial blooms, with fruitage fair and cool retreats, those bowery wilderness of sweets, the ambient air perfumes. I think that's, that's good stuff. Uh, the wondrous era we have seen placed on this isthmus half between a rude and polished state. It really captures the era, the moment, the challenge, I think. And, uh, and so for all those reasons, uh, and that we're at Mount Vernon, and this is an ode to Mount Vernon, uh, I, I'm delighted to have shared that in my thoughts with you. So it isn't, it's not since David Humphreys wrote to the ode to Mount Vernon in 1786 that we've had such a poetic talent on the estate. And that's what's really remarkable about this afternoon. Uh, what will happen next is I will introduce uh, Ron Smith, and then we will have another poet after Ron speaks. Then we'll have an intermission in which we'll give you a chance to go recharge your glasses and fill your 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 hearts with tea and your your plates with food. Uh, I will also say that we're not going to stand on ceremony here. This isn't a, this isn't church or school class. If you want to get up and get another drink in the middle of Ron's speaking, you can do that as well. Uh, I certainly might do that. Uh, so let's uh, let's have let's have some fun this afternoon and not uh, embalm ourselves, right? Okay. So uh, without further ado, then let's get the show on the road. Uh, Ron Smith. Poet Laureate of Virginia since 2014, George O. Squires Chair of Distinguished Teaching at St. Christopher's School in Richmond, degrees in English, Philosophy, and Humanities from University of Richmond, Masters of Fine Arts and Creative Writing from Virginia Commonwealth University, studied British Drama at Oxford and Renaissance and Modernist Culture at Ezra Pound Center for Literature in Murano, Fran Italy. Murano, Italy. Authored three books of poetry, It's Ghostly Workshop, 2013, Moon Road, 
2007, and running, against, running Again in Hollywood Cemetery, 1988, won many awards, including the Carol Weinstein Poetry Prize, Southern Poetry Review's Guy Owen Prize, and Poetry Northwest Theodore Rothka Prize. There's three things about Ron that are very that I that I like as well. Ron loves Rome. I love Rome. Ron loves baseball. I love baseball. And Ron loves Edgar Allan Poe, and I also love Edgar Allan Poe. So <laughs> that's why we hit it off so well. And so everyone, please give Ron a big Mount Vernon welcome. read that poem really well, didn't he? <laughs> nice job. Yeah. Well, he asked me to read a poem, too. Um, an older poem, that is. Uh, a poem by Phyllis Wheatley. The, uh, uh, in, in, well, after 1775, Phyllis Wheatley was said to be the most famous African on the face of the earth. And uh, the, uh, the poem that Doug asked me to read was His Excellency General Washington, and I will read that. But let me read first uh, this little uh, poem by Phyllis Wheatley, which I think is, is her greatest poem. It's a short poem, eight lines, four couplets. You're going to hear a lot of couplets in the next few minutes, just as you just did. Um, title of the poem is On Being Brought from Africa to America. "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as cane may be refined and join the angelic train." A very smart poem and uh, a very complicated poem in terms of tone. Um, and just as it, it rises to a, a pointed uh, moment, uh, we get these uh, um, very functional, interesting, playful, and yet deadly serious uh, puns. Uh, remember, Christians, of course, uh, that's fellow Christians. Negroes, black as cane, spelled C-A-I-N, may be refined. Of course, there's a pun on cane also. When you refine sugar cane, you get sugar. May be refined and join the angelic train. That's her most famous poem, and I think her greatest poem. The, uh, the poem she wrote to General Washington, and which she sent to him, and which he uh, loved and invited her uh, to visit him um, for. He uh, invited her to his headquarters at uh, Cambridge Mass uh, in uh, March 1776. Imagine meeting with General Washington in 1776 and they had a lovely conversation. Uh, here's the poem, more couplets. Uh, this is a poem very much of its time. His Excellency General Washington, I won't gloss all the mythology, the mythological trappings, I think they sort of make themselves clear. His Excellency General Washington, celestial choir, enthroned in realms of light, Columbia's scenes of glorious toils I write. While freedom's cause her anxious breast alarms, she flashes dreadful in refulgent arms. See Mother Earth her offspring's fate bemoan, and nations gaze at scenes before unknown. See the bright beams of heaven's revolving light involved in sorrows and the veil of night. The goddess comes. She moves divinely fair. Olive and laurel binds her golden hair. Wherever shines this native of the skies, unnumbered charms and recent graces rise. Muse bow propitious while my pen relates how poor her armies through a thousand gates as when Aeolus heaven's fair face deforms in ramp enwrapped in tempest and a night of storms astonished ocean feels the wild uproar the refulgent surges beat the sounding shore or think as leaves in autumn's golden rain such and so many moves the warriors train in bright array they seek the work of war 
where high unfurled the ensign waves in air. Voltaire knew of this woman, and as I say, she was uh, uh, universally um, praised and wondered at, since uh, most uh, American slaves, of course, were not, not only were not educated, but were, it was illegal to educate um, most of them. I'm, re I'm going to read you a poem in which I try to make George and Martha Washington human. Uh, I think we have a hard time with, with uh, George and Martha trying to see them as human beings like ourselves. They're, uh, they're closer to being gods or effigies or something. And so here's a poem about George Washington and his courtship of Martha Dandridge Custis. The young Washington was not only impressively dignified, he was also quite athletic. In this poem, he and Martha are both 26 or 27 years old. The point of view is more or less hers. There's a reference to uh, Barbados uh, where he uh, went and uh, Martha thinks all for nothing. Uh, that's because he went there for his brother's health and his brother later died. Suitor. She liked him, though she knew exactly what he was after, this tower of a man topped with flame. He came galloping up and flowed from the saddle with a dignified grace, flushed perhaps from the sun, and looked her straight in the eye. She wanted to put her tiny hand in his prodigious one, but he bowed as he always did and began to speak oh so carefully, yes, as he always did. Yes, she would walk with him. Yes, it was a fine day. When, to impress her, he had thrown those flat stones across the Rappahannock, she thought of Ulysses among the Phaeacians, the discus he threw like the demigod he was. Or was he? Ulysses, she meant, not this grandly self-conscious militia colonel who had returned from Barbados scarred by the pox and all for nothing. A perfect match, her land and his. He always won at pulling the stick or throwing the bar, and he could ride, oh, he could ride like a centaur. Hercules, he was the demigod, not Ulysses, who nevertheless made the Phaeacians flinch when he flung the humming disc out of sight and offered to box or wrestle any of them. Yes, of course she would write to him, for she loved receiving his courtesies in that controlled, precise hand. Come again, she said, and returning his bow a little ironically, felt her palms aching, though she didn't know why. I read that poem on the, on the floor of the House of Delegates and uh, at Virginia Delegates, and afterwards a reporter friend of mine said, wow, that was a lascivious poem. <laughs> and I said, don't say that again. You're arrested here. This is a poem about Thomas Jefferson, and uh, I think you probably know Thomas Jefferson published one book in his lifetime, uh, Notes on the State of Virginia. It's an astonishing fact, one book. Um, and I was reading it some a couple of years ago and finding it extremely informative, extremely dry, extremely informative. And then I came across this passage in which Jefferson started sounding like uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley or somebody. Uh, and I thought, what? I, somebody stuck a page in the wrong book. Uh, Jefferson owned Natural Bridge. And uh, he was writing about Natural Bridge, Virginia. Mr. Jefferson speaks of rapture, Natural Bridge, Virginia. Even though he knows Cedar Creek pours through it, he wants to believe it was cloven by a great convulsion. Master of all he surveys, he's been measuring it from below for some time. This, he will say, must not be pretermitted. God's Roman arch, he will not say, not this empire hater. He always provides a number of numbers. The arch approaches the semi-elliptical form, but the larger axis of the ellipsis, which would be the chord of the arch, is many times longer than the transverse. He will write that few men have resolution to look over into the abyss. He fell on his hands and knees at the edge. Intolerable, he cried, his head cloven by a savage migraine. Back at his desk, he writes of so beautiful an arch so elevated, so light, and springing, as it were, up to heaven. 
He likes the word sublime, but he can't keep out of his head the creeping and peeping. Mr. Jefferson writes through the night. And I do have some poems about Edgar Allan Poe. I've been uh, obsessed by Poe for many years. Uh, Poe is misunder he's the most misunderstood American writer, uh, maybe the most misunderstood American in some ways. Um, Poe was not an opium addict. He, he was not an alcoholic in, in the usual sense. He drank very rarely in a time when most American men drank a literally staggering amount from morning to night. Um, and we know very little about what happened to him at the end. He spent his last summer back in Richmond, his hometown, calling on the woman who was now a widow, his first love, Elmira Shelton. Uh, they were secretly engaged when he went away to University of Virginia, and that engagement was severed by her father and his foster father, John Allen. So at the end of his life, he comes back to Richmond, back to the, his first love, who is now rich, and he needs that. Um, and can comfort him uh, financially in other ways. Um, the first poem is called Mr. Poe Calls on Mrs. Shelton, and uh, it's a short poem. It's pretty tightly packed. Uh, Mrs. Shelton's house, you can go there today, is right across the street from uh, St. John's Church, where uh, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty, bless you, <laughs> or give me death, <laughs> and, uh, and where Poe's mother is buried. Uh, in a pauper's grave. Poe would have known that. Poe was sick that last summer. We don't know why. Mr. Poe calls on Mrs. Shelton. Below again the stone-cluttered hill wherein his mother takes the liberty of death, he turns his back on her and oh so deliberately then mounts toward the widow's door. He pulls the bell, sees again the ravaged nails he'll have to hide. He'll refuse spirits, he decides, decline even tea. No sherry, none. He's firm, yet feels so temporary. Next one's called, Edgar Poe Tries to Get His Act Together. <laughs> and it's set in 1849, that summer of 1849. Uh, Poe knew about the gold rush, the, the 49ers. And there are images uh, in his head, in this poem, of that salt plain uh, between Salt Lake City uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the, the terrible desert that has to be crossed. Poe joined the temperance union, um, the local temperance union, that last summer, not because uh, he necessarily needed it, because, but because uh, Elmira Shelton's sons had heard rumors about Poe. There were lots of rumors about Poe. And so he figured it would be a good idea to look more respectable by joining the Temperance Union. As a reference to William Blake in this poem, William Blake, one of the great bizarre geniuses, I think, uh, of all time, Blake once uh, went out when he was a kid to get a loaf of bread or something, and he was gone for hours, and when he came back, his parents said, where have you been? And he said, oh, I, I had to stop and look at the angels in the tree. And I, I believe if anybody could see angels, it would have been William Blake. Um, Poe, I'm not sure, uh, but we think of Poe as believing in all sorts of spiritualist stuff. Uh, that's not the Poe that, that I think I know. Edgar Poe tries to get his act together. Mr. Poe sits in Mrs. Shelton's parlor, freshly purchased hat on freshly creased knees, the place smelling somehow, he's decided, like a chemist's cupel. The sullen weight of the room's horsehair and mahogany gathers in his eyes. Why? would his hands and feet be cold in the heart of a Richmond summer. He almost told the girl a sassafras full of seraphim detained him till the hour was nearly gone. He planned to smile then, charmingly. The old flame he hopes will warm him wouldn't have heard of the crazed crudities of William Blake, but she knows Poe's never seen angels, though he's always given dead women every chance to shine. How dark can a parlor be, he's thinking, knowing this gloom is all the rage, yearning with shame for the bright lamps of the temperance meeting, crust of bread, gouge of greasy cheese, anything to ease the hot pinch in the pit of his stomach. Maybe she'll tell the girl to bring some tea. Words cluster thick as flies at the edge of a blinding plain of salt. That nagging out in the street, 
boys arguing about their dogs and the fishing in the James. Not one of them may live to Advent. But they've got youth's good odds written all over them and wholesome dirt, no doubt. And Poe, as clean in person as he's been in a fortnight, feels eternity pooling in his black boots, his shiny boots black as the ink he's been unable to scrape from beneath those longish nails. He curls his fingers under the Panama's brim into the O he thinks of vaguely, not without humor, as a mouth that wants to swallow his brain. He looks to the shadowy archway where she'll appear soon. She's not herself anymore, the cool paleness he lost forever. Not sweet Annie, not one of those airy creatures he's always had in mind, spirits floating in his mother's fragrance of orris root, is in fact a thickening widow, one who sees he believes in that desperate look he's had to face in the hotel's cloudy mirrors, the beguiling pain she found in his younger eyes. He'll settle, he's convinced himself, for a firm, flush soul. Shrewd, yes, but kind. Shadow men and their cumbered mules drag words he'll never make out, taller and taller across the whiteness toward a bloated sun. Thank you. Ron, that was fantastic. Uh, next up, we're going to have uh, Sophia Starnes, Poet Laureate of Virginia from 2012 to 2014, degree in English pedagogy from the Instituto de Idiomas in Madrid. Not bad. Uh, and Doctor of Letters from Union College in Kentucky. Author of five poetry collections and two anthologies, which have won numerous awards. They don't allow them up here if they're not award winners. <laughs> about that. Uh, a Commerce of Moments, 2003. Corpus Hominae, A Poem for Single Flesh, 2008. Fully Into Ashes, 2011. Love and the Afterlife, 2012. Poems have appeared or will appear in over 100 journals. Uh, received 10 finalist commendations in national and international competitions and listings. And who's who in the world, who's who in America, and who's who of American women. I'm delighted to be one of the first people to be able to announce that she also is winning the Vinnie Ream Award uh, for the highest, uh, 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 highest honor in poetry, uh, and that's an extremely exciting thing to be able to say. So, everyone, please, give Sophia a big welcome. Thank you very much, Doug. I, I want to clarify that that's a Vinnie in poetry. There's a Vinnie in fiction uh, uh, and in nonfiction that are being given from the National League of American Pen and Women. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, uh, everyone here and uh, Ron. Um, uh, Bill and I, my husband and I, were in Mount Vernon, but I never thought I'd come back and, and read poetry in such a marvelous uh, setting. I've read and, and uh, I don't remember who said this, but uh, that history, the history that we read about in books and the one with the big shifts, the pivotal moments, is like a river that um, flows inexorably, negotiating bends and ends up in the ocean. But that, the, that simultaneously to that, there's another history of equal or more importance. It's a history that occurs on the banks of the river where civilizations are born. I think it's very fitting that George Washington played such a pivotal role in the river of history that is home by the river, by the Potomac, where he lived with a family and uh, raised crops and uh, uh, experimented with new techniques, but lived the life of every civilization. If I'm not mistaken, Washington's great-grandfather was the one who left uh, England after the Civil War and uh, settled in Westmoreland County, and then two generations later, George Washington was born. So his roots in the, were in the old country. His genes are from there. I, I was born in, in the Philippines, daughter, a great uh, granddaughter of a stowaway in a galleon who left the old world, passed through the Americas and ended up in, in the Philippines. But my great grandfather was a child, was 14 year old when he, when he left as a stowaway. I think uh, John Washington was older than that. But he 
when I thought of my great grandfather, I thought of all the uh, children that, all, that became parents, that became the fathers and the grandfathers of the new world. And in thinking of them, I wrote this next poem. It's called The Genes We Choose. It's in the form of a ghazal, which is uh, uh, made up of couplets. And the, it has no strict meter, but it ends in a rhyming word. And I thought, this is like uh, the generations, the couplets and the genes repeating themselves. And the ghazal asks the author to place him or herself at the end. And I thought, like a recessive gene that reappears. So I tried to put, to put myself at the end. My name is not quite there, but maybe you can figure it out. <coughs> the poem is called The Genes We Choose. The lifting mist, a curtain lifts, remnants of a sail, happy the stowaways that sail. I am addicted to those fans over the doorways, clear symbols out of glass. What name does each entail? Once there were diamonds on a ship, the fleers of catastrophes, young boys in caps and girls with veils, watch them leaning on the bowsprit toward east. Some centuries turn children into birds and perch them on a boat's rail. The 19th was like this, when generations hithered, descending in a circular array, cousins, second kin, my heart's trail. Blessed are the hands and ankles wreathed in beads. Blessed, too, that errant gene, the rib that runs away from ribs, the bone in dark detail. The wise turn wiser with a child's breath, once more to see when roots fail. Speck in the blue, feed on a deck. It's time to raise the young sail. Um, the founders of our, our country share this genealogical, I mean, historical, if not a genealogical ancestry. So maybe it won't be too much of a digression if I read a poem that I wrote after we visited Montpelier, of the home of another founding father. And I did research, and I know that Washington and Madison got along. So that's, that's all right. I wanted to make sure I didn't. You now, there were some disagreements, but they, they got along. And I think um, Madison helped to craft Washington's farewell address, it says somewhere. There. <coughs> and when J Washington died, Madison wrote, the strength of his character lay in his integrity, his love of justice, his fortitude, the soundness of his judgment, and his remarkable prudence, to which he joined an elevated sense of patriotic duty. So I think um, they won't complain. I mean, it's not about um, Madison, but it was written my husband and I, Bill and I, and some friends were driving around Montpelier. This was some years ago. And we happened to come by the gravesite of James and Dolly Madison. At that time, it was being restored. And the, the, the team was there. And I, we approached and talked to the, the head of the team. It was a big man with br flaming red hair, big hands. But he would pick up a buckle, a comb, a little item from the, gra from the gravesite. And just looking at those items, he seemed to be conjuring an entire life. And I thought, how remarkable. Not so much that a thing brings up a life, but that our thought of the thing conjures a life. So maybe the power of the life is in thought and in desire. So when you have questions that you don't know the answer for, you write a poem. And the poem is called The Monument Restorer. Between storms and obelisk, a man and the oils of a late sun streaming he tolls away in the hard cavity of a field. A yard or so from our ankles, he soft brushes the dead. Lion mane, luminous head, hands bristly as paws, tease up the earth. Five years in still company. They're everywhere. Foot over flat foot, hair wisp on hair, shoe buckle and loose linen. Sheol, Sheol. Lord, how we bury, bless, Commend them to oak groans and wonder the universe owns. Could it be otherwise? We, swallowing the world, it and the withering stars, the carbon dissolution of a place so intended. Once out of this race, we, with a brush on the bricks, leveling ages. Sweethearts and weeds, the man and his broom, the obelisk and the small room under, where no one lies and no one sleeps and no one waits. I'd swear, a lost locket appears simply from loving, gold in the crook of his arm where dust leaks. Look, full are the man in the field, full are we under the sun. 
this uh, juxtaposition of life and death uh, was something that I imagine George Washington and many of our founding fathers lived with. They were farmers and planters and they were soldiers at the same time. And I thought about that and I thought I'd write a poem about, the, the poem is called How They Survive and it's set in our backyard which is about as close to nature as I get to every day. But um, it, it talks, of, it, it has images of war because there's a war constantly going on in this seemingly peaceful, placid place. How They Survive. Bold green and unchecked, this nettle skin of upstarts, and like a pimply rash, the loveless pigeon weed. Our backwoods itch and hatch their way of sparring, berries that answer in spurts, and in the dewy garden, anthills fielding marches underneath. A cat prowls at the edge, paws sticky with old tiger humors, sensing prey. But not the appended turtle with blotchy head, the snowy crow unveiled, unveiled, the pebble eyes and ambulate. Is this a story of win or lose, all's fair in love and war, fate of a species on the verge of scandal? Is this about our limping race, an army licked, a runt amid the trampled rushes? Wait, absolve the youngest skin, come press the face of mercy against it. All the same where burrows rest, and raptures dream of colonies. A sparrow, eyeing its odds, drops from the beach. Think of her eggs out of reach. Think of a scuffle in hatch. A lull, the lullaby stalemate. I have uh, two more poems. The next one is set in Fredericksburg, the scene of war. Uh, took me to Fredericksburg again on another trip and, and uh, the battle in December 9, 1862. And for those of you, I'm, I'm sure this is nothing new, but there's a, there used to be a house in the middle of the battlefield where Mrs. Stephen, a widow, lived. She refused to leave the battlefield in the middle of the, you know, I'm sure she was urged to leave, but she stayed through the night. And I think uh, she tended to some of the soldiers. So when we were there, I, I, shortly after that, I wrote this poem called Maurice Heights. That afternoon, we walked all over them with sparrows nibbling hay, Heartbeats counting headstones, arch and hem, were only halfway there. Once there was a winter and there was a war. Once before our fit footprints lay a spark, stories from a woman's yard. Her hollyhocks prickled with frost, a hungry fire hissed. Toward it, the feverish wandered. The woman served cardamom tea, so my version unfolds. One fist clenched in her apron, her ovum, her planet, her world, a dim, savable room which she saved. She gave everything else. Ages later, the park offers these, jars of beets, bags of corn, bread in basket, all ready to eat with a late reminiscence. Look into her eyes. There's Mrs. S, trading laws with the boys on her lime hill. Oh, grass grown uncountable and cindering young, consuming her cup of leaves over their cups of leaves, their short stories played through the night. And I'd like to close with a poem that I wrote for this occasion. I, I came across a photograph of Martha Washington's wedding shoes, which is probably not new to many of them. But I looked at them, my printer doesn't print, it's supposed, they're supposed to be purple. And in looking at them, I remembered, I keep my wedding shoes, I don't know how many women, I, I've never worn them again, they've got four heels, my husband is very tall, so I had to wear Four, I don't wear four heel, four inch heels shoes anymore. But I keep those embroidered shoes and I like to think that Martha Washington kept hers and uh, they ended up here. And so um, I, uh, thinking of her shoes and, and uh, what they might have meant to her, this is Martha's shoes. Purple, this pair of sequined shoes worn once for perfect weight and balance, a lady's emphasis on taste. Purple, their patter on the floor toward the one who waited, past heavy drapery, toe and heel, past her solitude over the wooden walkway. Having her voice would mean far more, of course, but it is long gone, glossed from her gold brocade, the pin rosette, the snow lace color. I take thee to my wedded husband, needless the world's audition. And since we have none of these, her lilt, the upward loving yes, 
unforgettable only to him who heard her. We turn toward her bridal shoes under the woven petticoat. How good, how finished true they are. Think of this. It is the aging, the wearing down of things that most disturbs us. The rubbed down leather of a trifled wallet, a glove's translucent fingertips laid flat, a stubborn tear, t tear twice sewn, the hazy overused <coughs> bifocals. They're all survivors among white handkerchiefs where the, where the solemn heart lives not. So, is there a shirt that you have worn just once? Or a midnight scarf, a pair of pinching shoes, slick on the dance floor? Is there one thing, one brand new handmade thing you might reserve for those to come, their little death to cheat? This was I once, they would hear, brave new, my lover's kiss to bear. This will I be again. That was remarkable. Thank you so much. Got that was shoes. better than champagne for me. That was great. Got uh, those shoes, Doug. What's that? Got those shoes. We have those shoes somewhere, right? Uh, yes, we do. Yeah, we yeah. Yeah. Cindy, you've written about those shoes as well. Yes. It's wonderful. Yes. Susan Schulwer, the uh, Robert H. Smith Senior Curator of Mount Vernon over there, looming. Uh, excellent. <laughs> uh, I promised you all an intermission. Let's take a five minute intermission. We'll, uh, begin again. This is fantastic.
To do something. The next speaker is going to speak from here. Uh, she, her, her voice is so. I think this is a more powerful mic. Okay. And she's going to also speak from here. Okay. It's fine. Just yeah, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we're, we're good. We're good. Well, you know what's up.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get the let's get the show on the road again. Make your way to your seats, fill your plates, turn off your phones. Let's give them a chance to settle down. Yeah, let's see right there. I like that silence has descended, so we're ready again. Well, you're in for a treat now. We've got two more fantastic poets. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have an opportunity. You all can come up and meet some of them and buy some of their books if you like. And we'll also have the opportunity for people who would like to, to tour the library. We brought out some of George Washington's letters. There's a letter in which he uh, sent a poem to Elizabeth Willing Powell who is a woman who was the, uh, a great socialite, great political figure in Philadelphia. Her husband was the mayor of Philadelphia when it was the capital of the United States. A uh, very wealthy couple. Uh, we also have uh, some other items that we brought out. Joel Barlow's Vision of Columbus, which I mentioned, uh, and uh, a Phyllis Wheatley poem that George Washington owned as well. So there'll be great things to see. Now, Back to the main event. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Kelly Cherry, Poet Laureate from Virginia 2010 to 2012, MFA from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Her parents were violinists, and this early exposure to music influenced her work. Author of more than 20 books and chapbooks of writing, including poetry, fiction, nonfiction, and memoir, has published two translations of ancient Greek dramas. <laughs> That's fantastic. R received fellowships from Rockefeller Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, Ragdale Foundation, and, and Yaddo. Inaugural recipient of the Haynes Poetry Prize and the Ellen Anderson Award. And was the director's visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton in 2010. Please, everybody welcome Kelly Cherry. Thank you very much. Um, I have weak vocal cords. If this isn't working well, please shout. Okay. I also need to tell you that I've brought just four or five um, flyers for a book about George Washington. It's a children's book called George Washington and Me. And it's by the daughter of um, Melvin Kalb. I think Melvin is his first first name. The newspaper writer, journalist. Well, anyway, he's quite famous. <laughs> <laughs> Just not here. Uh, Marvin, Marvin Kalb, that's the name. Uh, anyway, I thought some of you might be interested in a children's book, um, and I will let Ron put it over there. I have no poems about George Washington, but we received a message that said we could also use poems about Virginia, and I do have poems about Virginia. Here's one called God's Picnic. It's in the Blue Ridge. God takes a left off the skyline drive, parks at a scenic view, picks out a rock, unpacks a picnic. The valley is a hammock strung between mountains. He chews while gazing at the panorama. Later, he drives back to his motel, nearly empty off season, enters his room to write a poem about the state of his creation. We live on a farm in the southern part of Virginia, and this is called a farm in Virginia near the North Carolina boundary. 
The shadow of a grass blade falls upon the worm. A blue-tailed skink slips in under the door. This is life as lived on a southern farm with fruit trees, apple orchard, fig and pear. Scarlet tanagers let themselves be seen from time to time. Rabbits and deer devour the season's garden. Bees linger at the screen. Some days the sky is low and seems to lower, and others blue in cloud, with clouds of rickrack trim, or black with blowing rain that stills and hushes the birds while large mouth bass and turtles swim in the muddy bottom pond. Rain rattles bushes. It's busy here. A lot is going on most all the time. And now and then star scarlet tanagers, bright baubles in the morning sun, and shy, despite the gaudy garb of harlot, fly by a pair. House wrens flock at the feeder. The bees that fumble at the sill will swarm. A cardinal relaxes in a cedar. This is life on a small southeastern farm. A blue-tailed skink slips out under the door. The shadow of a grass blade crosses the worm. And now I'm going to read one that's a little long. If it's too long, you can shout at me. If it's too short, I'll read another. <laughs> <laughs> this is a found poem, and it's from Bird's Survey of the Boundary. It's not from any one passage. I picked different little passages and patched them together to create this poem. It's, it was, uh, the book was written in the year of 1728. The Prospect. We were, again, agreeably surprised with a full prospect of the mountains. They discovered themselves both to the north and south of us. One of the southern mountains terminated in a horrible precipice that we called the Despairing Lover's Leap. It had rained a little in the night, which dispersed the smoke and opened this romantic scene to us. The Hazards. The bread had begun to grow scanty and the winter season to advance apace. We had likewise reason to apprehend the consequences of being intercepted by deep snows and the swelling of many waters between us and home. About elk. One of the men picked up a pair of elk's horns, rare to find any token of those animals so far to the south. They are very shy and have the sense of smelling so exquisite that they win a man at a great distance. They commonly herd together, and the Indians say if one of the drove happened by some wound to be disabled from making his escape, the rest will forsake their fears to defend their friend, which they will do with great obstinacy till they are killed on the spot. Though otherwise, they are so alarmed at the sight of a man that to avoid him, they will sometimes throw themselves down very high precipices. The Prospect. In the afternoon, we marched up again to the top of the hill to entertain our eyes a second time with a view of the mountains, but a perverse fog arose. The hazards. The rain continued most of the day and some part of the night, which incommoded us much. The prospect. In the evening, a brisk northwester swept all the clouds from the sky and exposed the mountains as well as the stars to our prospect, the hazards. We encamped on Crooked Creek 
near a thicket of canes, though to our sorrow, firewood was scarce. And now I need to tell you what I should have told you at the beginning of this poem and forgot, which is that in those days the word rampant meant having diarrhea. <laughs> okay. About bear, our hunters killed two bears which made all other misfortunes easy. Certainly no Tartar ever loved horse flesh better than woodsmen do bear. The truth of it is, it may be proper food for such as work or ride it off, but with our chaplain's leave who loved it much, I think it not a very proper diet for saints because tis apt to make them a little rampant. <laughs> And now for the good of mankind and for the better peopling, an infant colony, which has no want but that of inhabitants, I will venture to publish a secret of importance which our Indian disclosed to me. I asked him the reason why few or none of his countrywomen were buried, to which, he, to which question he answered with a broad grin upon his face. They had an infallible secret for that. If any Indian woman did not prove with child at a decent time after marriage, the husband, to save his reputation with the woman, forthwith entered into a bear diet for six weeks, which in that time makes him so vigorous that he grows exceedingly impertinent to his poor wife and tis great odds, but he makes her a mother in nine months. And thus much I am able to say besides, for the reputation of the bear diet, that all the married men of our company were joyful fathers within 40 weeks after they got home. And most of the single men had children sworn to them within the same time. <laughs> our chaplain always accepted who, with much ado, made a shift to cast out that kind of devil by dint of feast, fasting, and prayer. <laughs> Is there time for one more or not? Yes. Okay. This is just a little poem called The Shape of the Air. And it's a, again, it's a Virginia poem. There's a Virginia section in this book, luckily. <laughs> the shape of the air. It was raining goldfinches, pouring like water. They filled the lawn with light, bright as bullion. And then they vanished, a stream rushing down the sky. The light left, the coolness of their small storm left. We'd only memory to see them by. Must beauty be sudden and short, a surprise that dies? Or is beauty the shape of the air after flinches fly? Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you very much. So last but not least, certainly not least at all, Carolyn Kreider Ferranda, Poet Laureate of Virginia from 2006 to 2008, MED, MA, and PhD from George Mason University, received letter of recommendation for quality research from VA Virginia Educational Research Association for dissertation gathering light, a poet's approach to poetry analysis. Maybe we can ask her what she thinks of all these poems that we've been hearing so far. <laughs> Published seven po books of poetry, including The Embrace, Diego Rivera, and Frida Kahlo, one which won the 2014 Art in Literature Mary Lynn Cotts Award, recipient of five grants from the Virginia Commission on the Arts, won multiple first place awards from Chesapeake Bay Branch of the National League of American Pen Women, Poems have appeared in numerous magazines and featured in two art installations at McLean Metro Station in Northern Virginia. So please, everybody, welcome Carolyn.
Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It was wonderful to walk in and see some of my Northern Virginia friends sitting in the audience. I lived here for 31 years, and it will always be a part of my spirit. Um, I also want to thank Stephen for organizing the event, Ron for inviting us, Doug, uh, Sarah Myers and Dawn Bonner helped with some research uh, for the poems that I wrote. Um, I did write three poems about George Washington inspired by him. Um, my husband and I are dancers. So I was immediately enthralled by the fact that George Washington loved to dance and he was a superb dancer. This is only one of the paintings that inspired me. There are several. Um, but I wrote a poem that is a villanelle and I use that because I thought it would be appropriate because of the repetition of lines and the rhyme, uh, the musicality, the lyricism. The poem is entitled, The Birth Night Ball. The general takes her hand and glides across the floor, entranced by the minuet's light-hearted grace, while regal tones of violins and a cello soar. The candle's flames adorn walls, sculpted doors. They illuminate Nellie's youthful face as he lifts her hand and glides across the floor. The lilt and sway of instruments call for all to rise and dance, a hand's embrace, each bow regal as the purest notes soar. Tall, august, muscular as war, the general commands the room, keeps pace in palm menu, then glides across the floor. Dispelling winter scorn, he adores these unpretentious slender steps, a trace of Bach, the lofty tones of violins as a cello soars. His fair complexion, his blue-gray eyes score admiration from ladies fanning their faces. In folding Nellie's hand, he glides across the floor, the merry tones of violins and a cello soar. Um, I'm so happy that there is a breeze out because I do mention the, the breeze uh, that Washington enjoyed when he was on the piazza. Uh, when I came up here to do a little research, I was just taken by um, this particular painting, a view of Mount Vernon with the Washington family. And Latrobe uh, painted this piece after spending the night here in 1796. Um, and Washington was taking a break from the Capitol in Philadelphia during his second term as president. Uh, the poem is called A Midsummer Evening on the Piazza. Shadows flit along the promontory as two ships ringed and setting sun sail by the mansion like a whisper. The president retreats to the piazza to the comfort of bird calls lifting out of manicured bushes. Stately in a Windsor chair, he relishes the mild breeze sweeping through the columns, this sheltered space far from the upheavals of a new nation. Mrs. Washington and a child look on as a playful spaniel leaps in midair. A guest explores the grounds through a spyglass, while Nellie, mesmerized by a cardinal's slow trill, leans against a wooden pillar. The familiar notes of nature's harpsichord ascend. There are no imperfections here as evening awakens, the banquet tea served from a silver urn. No one missing a thing on this airy veranda, its solitude is quelling as the Potomac's tidal flow. When I walked through the uh, mansion, I was really taken by um, the study and I could feel 
uh, George Washington's presence there. It's, it's such a calming place and it's the, the type of space that I need when I'm working on my own writing. I think most writers do uh, love that solitude. But I was also taken by the portrait of Lawrence, his half-brother, who was George's mentor. Um, and he really looked up to him and I thought it was appropriate that that was in the study. Um, so I wrote another villanelle entitled A Private Place. Every day Washington awakes at sunrise, retreats to the study, a sanctuary where he composes letters, reads books. Astute, wise, he seeks answers to crop rotation, ways to fertilize farm fields, lessen reliance on tobacco, pair wheat with corn. Each day he awakes at sunrise, seeks solace in a room where he analyzes the nation's unrest, the effects of warfare. He composes letters, reads books. Astute, wise, he manages the estate, the outlying farms, advises overseers, records expenses in a wooden chair. Disciplined, every day he awakes at sunrise, Descend stairs to a haven, a place that belies its strength, built-in bookcases, a desk where he composes diary entries, letters. Astute, wise, he finds solitude in a chamber hidden from skies, in the portrait of Lawrence lit up like a prayer. Every morning, Washington awakes at sunrise, composes letters, reads books. Astute. Wise. Uh, George Washington loved the natural world and so do I. I've always felt a connection to the land. Um, and I'm wondering, do any of you know how Stingray Point, uh, which is where I live, I'm about six miles from there, um, on the Middle Peninsula, uh, do any of you know why it's called Stingray Point? Um, Captain John Smith, let me show you this next slide, uh, took many historic voyages, as we know, up the Chesapeake Bay. And at Stingray Point, he was stung by a stingray. And fortunate for him, there was, I know this is what you learn when you live in the country, uh, fortunate for him, there was a doctor who applied a precious oil. Um, and sometimes I'll just go out to the end of the peninsula. I love it if you look in the lower right hand corner um, and come up with poems. And this is called By the Bay. How easy to become a part of this fertile past. A vast amazed sky, gulls billowing, their small white sails caught in impetuous breezes. To be here beyond a peninsula's tip in a temple of wind, where an inlet's waters wash over my feet, the Chesapeake misting over with the aura of coastlands. I call out from this point, as if expecting honey, vanilla, and tobacco from a passing ship to blow ashore in boxes. What is it about the bay that startles the heart? The cloud's wealth opens up, each drop cleansing, all at once I am washed in translucent wine. Do any of you um, know what our state boat is? The, st the state boat of Virginia? <laughs> yes, there is a state boat. <laughs> Does anyone know? Okay, little history lesson on the side here. <laughs> Um, it's a Chesapeake Bay dead rise, and I drove down to the Maritime Museum, which is just a few miles from where I live, to take this picture of a boat that John England is building. Um, and I love, this is one of my absolute favorite boats, and I love the whole uh, business of going out the crabbing and, and catching the oysters. And it made me think of George Washington because of his uh, fisheries uh, going for the heron and the shad up here on the Potomac. Uh, so I wrote a poem about the Jenny Dawn, one of these um, work boats. 
The caretaker rubs grime from the Jenny Dawn's salty planks, like a farmer scrubbing the flanks of his muddy horse. Feeling an indrawn breath blow off the bay, he slips back in time, finds himself aboard another work boat, twang of a barrel chest cutting the currents, while watermen oystering pull yeal, sort out empty shells. Separating peelers and busters from soft shells, far off the Allen boys crab. Nowadays, pleasure seekers come to town longing for a sea romp aboard the Miss Lily, the Agnes, Lady Marion, and the Jenny Dawn, city-bred folks who know nothing about the rustic tools it took to shape these seafaring ladies so they could handle the currents, draw up bushels of seafood. 55 was one of the best yields. The year before, Hazel had stirred up creatures from the depths. Who would believe that a strong cleaning could breathe life into this old girl? Listen to her sigh like a wave's whoosh, like the cedars that gave her life so she could gather the water's bounty. All those trips into the rivers and bay, scrubbing, he listens to the rest of her tales, the distance swells bluing, and the sky quiet like the eye of a storm. I really admired Washington's research into what he was going to do when the tobacco uh, wasn't as prosperous as he would have liked because of the clay, the soil. We have the same problem where I live, and so our crop rotation is wheat, corn, and soybeans. Um, and some of you may know this wonderful series by Claude Monet. He, Claude Monet said, a landscape lives by the air and light which constantly change. And I thought about hay bales, haystacks, um, and I'm going to read a poem, Another Villanelle, uh, that was inspired by this atmosphere. What is it about ever-changing light, elusive as it falls on bundled grain, altering the way we perceive the sight? Bales laced, the marbleized night hovers above a dappled terrain. What is it about the changing light in moistened fields, the upright stack shimmering in feathery rain, changing our perception, our sight? Farmers baling hay in late afternoon light witness how fleeting shadows sustain a sunset's fire changing into night. How a profusion of pink ignites two misted stacks, the sheen like porcelain changing again, the ephemeral sight. Evening's ponso settles over bright straw stalks, their burnt orange hearts lain bare by a burst of ever changing light, shifting, perceive it in clear sight. And you know, George Washington was uh, such an observer. He really took time to look and to assess what was before him. And I admire that. I admire the fact that, that we uh, need to take that time to look. Thank you for mentioning the part about the art installation. I just have one more poem to share with you. Are, are you all... So you're being so attentive, I love it. <laughs> uh, thank you, polite, attentive. Um, I worked with Claudia Emerson, who was a former Virginia Poet Laureate, who sadly um, we lost, um, but in a way we will never lose her because we are determined to keep her spirit alive. Uh, Claudia was amazing, and she believed in uh, really promoting other writers, and I know the Poets Laureate here believe the same thing. Um, this is a work by Martin Donlan, who is an internationally acclaimed artist. There are two of these installations at the McLean Station, and we are also uh, going to show the work of emerging and established poets. Um, if you'll look at this next slide, you can see just a part, this is just an excerpt of one of my poems that appears there. And also, I want to point out that Kelly's work is here. Have you had a chance to see your work on site? And the McLean, I'll send you some slides because Patricio and I went up there and took pictures. Um, but to read this last poem, I want you to be able to see what I saw. 
you know, you see people looking through binoculars when they go bird watching. I just want to look at the birds. And so I wrote a poem when I was on Lake Nakuru in Africa um, that's entitled, You Don't Need Binoculars to Be a Bird Watcher. Have you any of, have any of you been to Lake Nakuru? <laughs> Take Lake Nakuru in Kenya, the vast number of flamingos. What greater bird than the lesser? Carmen red, the legs startle the water. Perched on stilts, it slips its bill beneath the surface flips its tongue into place, then dips for algae. Outnumbered, the greater towers to six feet, feeds on mollusk, then clears the lake, soars over tiers of yellow acacias glinting in pure sun. Rock-strewn hills, every detour opens up on pelicans, seems an overture to the view at the top. Pink slides from sky like a rainbow into your eyes, mesmerized by the flight. You ask why there's so many birds rushing to earth. Don't waste time looking through binoculars. Start running to the lake's edge for a closer view. Look into the liquid heart where the blue-green pulsates, red beaks sucking, then spewing out water. Follow the pelican's snow-white ascent into the flamingo's flight. Be like the birds. Lift. Ignite. And now, um, before I sit down, I want to know, is there anyone in here who's never won anything? <laughs> you never won the lottery, <laughs> the million dollars. Okay, here we go. Um, the, speaking of promoting other poets, uh, this book has poems by four previous poets laureate. And Sophia Starnes has copies of uh, four additional poets laureate and a wonderful book that she edited. Uh, Grace Simpson recently passed. She is a fabulous writer, so you get to enjoy her work. Who else has never, who else, okay, here we go. Let's give Carolyn a big round of applause. And, and could I get another round of applause for all the poets, Lauren? Could you all stand up? Stand up. Come on. Stand up. Come, get, get. Thank you so much. What a lovely way to spend an afternoon. This has been great, and a great audience as well. Now, they're going to be up here for you all to come up. They've got some books, uh, and uh, I know they love to talk, so come up and ask them questions. Uh, I'd like to point out the chief librarian, Mark Santangelo, in the back. Mark, thank you. Well, well, <laughs> well done. That's a good applause line. Mark is, uh, well, he's offering him his services of himself and his uh, wonderful staff to take people into the library to see the vault of George Washington's books and some of the items that we've brought out. If, you, if you're interested in that, Mark will organize you in his way, I imagine. And uh, uh, with that, I invite you all to you know, have some more sandwiches. Looks like we have plenty to go around. And, uh, and, and thanks again for coming out to, uh, to Mount Vernon on this beautiful day. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. You guys, I can listen to you all for another hour. It was great. Yeah, that was, I think, yeah. <coughs> really moving forward. Yes, it's 